I wouldn't admit this to most people, but since I'm not sharing my name here, I feel safe saying it. The truth is that being a park ranger in a national park can be completely overwhelming. For example, sometimes you need to keep secrets that will eat you up inside. I'm a park ranger here in Yosemite National Park. I've been working here for about eight months now, and I'm still getting used to the job and learning new things. You see, we have a lot of so-called secrets that we keep from the general public. For example, did you know that we have a file that we keep that's basically filled with things that park rangers have experienced that can't be explained? I've been told to keep these secrets to myself and to never share them with anyone. But sometimes it's hard not to say anything at all, which is why I'm writing to you now, anonymously. To start with, there was this one time when I had a really close call with what I think was a Wendigo. It all started on my first week of work. I was assigned to patrol the north side of the park. That day, I was patrolling the woods and I was going to check out a report of an injured deer. It turned out that it was just a dead deer, but as I was walking closer to the carcass, I noticed something moving in the trees, something that seemed to be tracking or following me. At first, I thought it was a bear or another large animal. As I got closer, though, I realized that this thing looked like a man, but not quite. Its skin was a grayish, dark, translucent, hard to explain and there were long arms with claw-like hands. Its eyes were bright red and its mouth was dripping saliva and snarling at me. Also, on its head, I could see what looked to be horns, but one side was longer and more intact than the other, which made me wonder what kind of fight had it been in. And then as I was staring at it, the creature started growling at me more ferociously and began running towards me. Thinking quickly, but not doing as I was trained at all, I pulled out my gun and shot at it several times. Unfortunately for me, though, this thing seemed to be bulletproof. All the bullets seemed to do was anger the creature even more. It kept approaching. Once I realized that I and my gun were no match for it, I jumped back into my vehicle and I drove away as fast as I could. But the creature was faster still. It kept on chasing after me, and it seemed to be enjoying my fear and staying just close enough behind my vehicle to really rattle me. I knew there was no way I could beat this thing. Luckily for me, though, I rounded a corner in the road and I came up on the other rangers patrolling the area. I started honking my horn and screaming out the window. Thank God they heard my screams for help and they turned around and started driving towards me. The creature then stopped chasing me and now turned to face the rangers as they approached it. It faced them, and it took a stance that very clearly said, do not get any closer. All I could now see was that this thing was staring at the rangers with its bright red eyes, snarling at them and growling like a rabid animal. The rangers slowed down their vehicle, but as soon as they realized what was happening, they didn't stop but rather they yelled at me to follow them. I did as they said, and I followed them back to the ranger station. Once we got there, they told me that what I saw was a Wendigo, and that it's not something you can kill. I told them I had no idea what that was, and they explained to me that this creature lives in the woods around here, and it feeds on deer and other animals, but it will sometimes prey on humans too. They also told me that if it thinks your food it will try to kill you. For obvious reasons, they don't tell new hires about it until they have to. So as you can imagine, I'm still living in fear of being attacked by this thing again whenever I'm out in the field. And even though I've been trained better than this, when things get really crazy out there, I pray. I was driving home on a Sunday evening after having dinner with my family and family friends at my mom's house, the house I grew up in. I live in northern Michigan, north of Traverse City in Antrim County, but I'm now living on my own. As I was driving home, it wasn't long before I was on the section of the drive heading past an industrial park, when I noticed a strange shape fly across the road about 50 feet ahead of me. 
I had never experienced anything like that in all my years here, so it really stuck in my head and got me to thinking what it could be. At first I thought it was an owl or some other large bird because of how fast and low it flew, but I couldn't really tell and that theory didn't really make sense anyway, not at this time of night. So after this short and quick fly across the road, the thing disappeared, and I completely lost sight of it. It was so weird, though, that I decided to pull into a gravel lot to park and look around for what it could be. I looked around for a while, but nothing materialized, so I just decided to move along and keep driving home. And then, while walking back to the car, I started to hear a loud rumble that seemed to be surrounding me on all sides. I stopped, and I stood still to try and listen more closely and to figure out where it was coming from. And that's when hundreds of birds came flying out of the trees, scattering in all directions. They were followed by the largest living creature I have ever seen. This thing literally jumped out of a tree and then landed about 10 feet away from me on the other side of a barbed wire fence. Thank God there was a fence between it and me because I was completely frozen in fear. The thing appeared to be about seven feet tall, and it was covered from head to toe with thick black hair. It seemed muscular, and it had large biceps and forearms. The creature looked like an ape, or maybe even a human, except it had the face of a dog. I just remember looking into its eyes and feeling pure fear and dread all at the same time. It stared at me through the fence, and it glared right into my eyes. The look on its face was just so evil and mean. It stared at me for a good five to ten seconds before it turned around and looked backwards. I looked in that same direction and felt dizzy when I noticed two more creatures that looked just like it were off in the distance. All three of the creatures had bodies that looked dog-like. Their arms were dog-like too, with hands that had claws instead of human-like hands. Bodies were covered with thick fur. I could tell because of how bulky their bodies seemed to be compared to a human form. The creatures all turned and looked at me at the same time, and we all just stood there looking at each other. And that's when the one closest to me started approaching the fence that was between us. It kept getting closer and closer until it was right up against the fence with its face squeezing against the metal, looking straight at me. I panicked. I got in my car, locked all the doors, and started to turn on the car. However, right then the creature screamed incredibly loudly, which startled me so much I couldn't even think how to turn the key. And then, in an instant, this thing jumped the fence, came at me jumped across my hood and ran off into the other side of the car and was now standing just outside my door. I couldn't even tell you for a million dollars how it jumped that fence and how it was now standing next to me. I just remember the thing being there on the other side of the fence one second and then standing next to my car on this side the next. I watched it through my window as it looked right at me, smiling, evilly, showing its fangs and flexing its muscles. It had dog-like teeth, but they were extremely long. All I could think was that they looked like vampire fangs. And then it hit the hood of my car so hard, which was terrifying. And somehow in that moment, I knew I was dealing with a dog man. And I needed to figure out what to do next and how to get out of there alive. I specifically remember starting to pray. The dog man was standing right next to my car, looking in at me through the window while I was praying so loudly, I'm sure he heard every word. I felt like this thing was going to break open my door and come in the car, but thank God it didn't. After a few seconds of not moving or doing anything, I remember that I had pepper spray in my glove compartment, and I decided that I needed to get it out immediately if things were going to go south. So I reached for the glove box and I opened it as quickly as possible. And that's when the creature started sniffing at the air, like something had caught its attention. And that's when it disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. I next saw it in a bush on the other side of the fence and up against the woods. It peered back at me for a few seconds and then ran back into the forest, where all three of them disappeared almost instantly, noiselessly. 
That's when I started to think about my phone, which was still sitting in the passenger seat, thinking that I should call 911. But my fear got the best of me, and instead I peeled out of there, and I drove until I got home, where I went straight to the computer and googled Dogman. I couldn't believe how much information popped up, and all of it made me realize that I had 100% just had a Dogman encounter. It was literally 4 a.m. when I turned off the computer. I had written down everything I could remember about the event, hoping to post about it someday. I have to tell you that I waited all these years to share my story because I was scared. I had told friends and family about it, but none of them really believed me. At least, no one other than my mom. She knows me well enough to recognize that I was truly terrified. She also understands why I have a hard time driving that stretch of road anymore. And for a while there, everybody came to me when we all got together. Anyway, I'll continue looking for answers, but let me tell you, if you live in or near Antrim County, Michigan, and you see something strange, just turn around and go back home as fast as you can. Don't second guess your instincts because it is not worth the risk of losing your life. First off, let me know if anybody here is from Puerto Rico. And if so, do you have any insight into this situation? I run an animal sanctuary and dog rescue just outside of San Juan. There are massive populations of stray cats and dogs on the island, and I do my best to bring them in and help. We have connections with vets and clinics, and we see a ton of issues, including mange and fleas, as well as malnourished and abandoned animals. We set them up with adopters on the island, although most adopters come from the mainland, and these animals travel by airplane to meet the rescuers. Well, this all started last fall and has been happening about three times every month since. I'd like to think it's just a coincidence, but it's getting too common for that. The first time it happened, I was shocked. But now it's been over 30 instances, and it's only gotten worse. The local police have been no help, and every time I post images on Facebook, they get deleted. I don't know who else to turn to, so I'm hoping that somebody here will have an idea. What it is, is that we've been getting calls about animals in the area acting strangely. They're usually kind of loopy and disoriented. They walk around and they teeter as they walk. Usually if they try to jump up or walk upstairs, they lose their balance and sometimes trip over themselves. Now this is both cats and dogs. Our team will bring the animals in and after about a week, they start to act normally again. It's a slow process. It's like they're drunk when they first come in, and it lasts maybe three days, and then one morning, they wake up and they're very skittish. They start moving quicker, and they sometimes snap at us, but they're mostly just nervous. Then after a few days of being hyper-nervous, there will be a full day of aggression. The dogs will be barking through the bars of the cages and foaming at the mouth even. The cats will stick their paws out of the bars and swat at the crew that's passing by. We ended up with a ton of bite marks and scratches from the first few animals we brought in. This was before we noticed the pattern and how it plays out. So now we've learned to quarantine each animal that comes in with this disorderly behavior, and we won't let them interact until after that final day of aggression. After that, the animal may just be the sweetest or the most typical stray. And then we start to post them on the adoption websites. None of the adopters have complained about behavioral problems. In fact, they all seem to love their new dogs and cats. They even send me photos and videos of snuggling with them, even kids. They act just so odd this first week, which is the part that we don't understand. One person who called in about one of the strays said that they saw the animal being thrown from a black van without any distinguishing marks. Really, it's despicable what people will do to vulnerable animals, but unfortunately, it's not unheard of. On the next call that came in, I asked the person if they had seen a black van go by, and they said, in fact, there was, one that was speeding by just a bit earlier, and the speed had caught their attention. 
I was just shocked because I thought maybe the animals were just eating something bad. But now I believe they're being tested on or something. The reason I'm writing to you and not a veterinary clinic or animal control is because I believe that there's something strange going on and some type of organization that's making these animals act this way. After we started getting so many of these calls and bringing in the strays that acted loopy, we began plotting down the locations on a map. Basically, the map shows a one-mile radius around a business district. I don't want to disclose the particular area because I don't want anybody to get hurt, but I went and I checked out the area myself. What I found was a bunch of warehouses and factories and shipping container lots that had been abandoned. So I was surprised when I saw a very new and very clean black van driving around. I hightailed it out of there because I didn't want to be seen looking around and get myself in trouble. But I called the police to discuss it. They told me that they can't do anything about it unless I actually witness something happening and get concrete evidence or a plate number. Now that's absurd because the van or the vans that we've been seeing were unmarked. At least, I've never seen a plate. I then contacted a friend at Animal Control to see if they had been noticing this behavior. They said they had seen it too. And another shelter also noticed a similar trend. There are a few Facebook groups that I'm in, and the shelters that are further from the capital say that they have not been experiencing this. So I know something odd is going on, and I hope that you might be able to help. So please, just anybody, let me know if my story corresponds to anything you have heard of in the past. I was investigating a case of stolen sled dogs at a kennel near Silver Bay, Alaska. The problem started in the early fall before the first snowfall. On multiple occasions, one or two dogs would go missing at a time. If you've never been to a sled dog kennel, the dogs are typically housed outside tethered to their individual shelters. The mushers run them once or twice a day, except in the summer so they won't overheat. This particular kennel was close to the musher's house. He could see most of the dogs from his front window, and if I remember correctly, there were about 65 dogs on the property in total. It was an ongoing case as we never could figure out exactly what was happening. The musher was convinced that the dogs were being stolen Every time the dogs would disappear at night, he would find their empty collars in the morning. I thought the dogs were just slipping out of their collars and escaping themselves, but the musher wasn't convinced. He said that the collars on the dogs were martingale collars and they were nearly impossible to escape from. Someone had to loosen them to release the dogs. I questioned why they would loosen the collars instead of just unclip the tether. That would make the most sense to me if I was trying to steal a dog. I would keep the collar on the thing so that it couldn't get away from me. These dogs were huskies and they weren't exactly known for sticking around when they got loose. There wasn't much I could do for him about the situation unless I had legitimate proof of the dogs being stolen. I told the musher to set up some trail cams, which he did. That way, we would have some concrete evidence of what was happening to the dogs. The problem was, the dogs were still going missing, but nothing on the trail cams. Not a thing. I sent out a notice to all the local veterinarians and animal shelters in the area to be on the lookout for these missing dogs. We put out notices on multiple social media platforms and we even offered rewards, but we received no responses. And then winter came. The snowfall would give us the means to find out what exactly was happening to those sled dogs. If they were indeed being stolen, we would have the footprints of the perpetrators as well as vehicle tracks. The musher called me after a couple of days after the first big snowfall and said another dog went missing and that I should get out there as soon as possible. I told him do not disturb the scene and that I would be out immediately. I cleared my morning schedule and I drove out to the kennel. Now, I would consider myself a logical person. I'm not superstitious in any way. I don't believe in monsters. 
I just knew there would be some reasonable explanation for this at the end of the day when I dug down to the truth. But I wasn't ready for what I found out there. It flipped everything I ever believed to be true right on its head. The musher showed me to the shelter of the latest missing dog. The musher's footprints were the only human prints there. Obviously, there were dog tracks, but there was something else there, too. They were too large to be wolf tracks, but they were definitely of the canine variety. They were about the size of my own feet, but the problem was there were only tracks from the rear feet. Only one set of tracks. I had done quite a bit of hunting and tracking in my youth. I knew what animal tracks looked like. I knew how they moved. If I didn't know better, I would say this thing walked on two legs. The musher mentioned it too. We both just looked at each other, but neither of us wanted to say what we were thinking because frankly, it didn't make sense. I took photos of the tracks and examined the area as thoroughly as I could. I found another strange print on the roof of the missing dog's shelter. It looked like a handprint of some sort. There were only four fingers on the hand and there appeared to be claw marks etched into the snow at the ends of the fingers. I didn't know what to tell the musher. We both knew that there was something very out of the ordinary going on here, but neither of us wanted to start speculating because our ideas sounded crazy. We ended up following the wolf tracks across the property and through a dense forest until we lost them when we crossed an old logging road that the musher used for sledding. I didn't have much advice for him. I told him that he was well within his rights to defend his dogs with lethal force if he caught whatever was taking them. He went to town later that day and installed a temporary electric fence around the dog yard, hoping to keep whatever the creature was out. I didn't hear from the musher for a few weeks after that, and he didn't return my last phone call. So I decided to take the drive up to the kennel. He was in the process of building a barn to house his dogs indoors, and there was also an electric fence around the barn now. He looked rough when I saw him, like he hadn't slept in weeks. I asked him if he had any more problems with his dogs going missing, but he was tight-lipped about it. It took a while but I finally got the story out of him. He didn't want me to think he was crazy, and to be honest, I probably would have if I hadn't seen those tracks myself. He said he finally caught the thing at night, in the dog yard. He said it looked like a cross between a wolf and a man. It was all covered in gray hair and had the head of a wolf, but that it could walk upright when it wanted to. He said it walked up to one of his dogs and tried to take its collar off when he opened the door of his house and shot at it. He couldn't tell if he hit it or not, but the shot sent it running. He watched it head off into the forest, and as he watched it run off, he saw what he feels were some of his dogs in the forest too. He didn't know how to feel about that. He was glad no harm had come to the missing dogs, but he wondered what the creature wanted with them. And frankly, what exactly was the creature? Where did it come from? Had it always lived there in the North Woods? I didn't have an answer for him. I don't think he expected me to. I do know that he built an extensive indoor kennel for his dogs, and that seemed to keep them home safe. He never called again about the wolf creature. But I'm pretty certain it's still out there somewhere. I live in Michigan, and we have a lot of Dogman stories here. The History Channel actually did a whole Monster Hunters piece on us, trying to see if something strange really did live in our woods. I watched that episode, and at the time, I thought it was far-fetched. I didn't think I would ever see anything like it for myself. The Dogman is kind of like a Sasquatch of the Great Lakes. Everyone hears Bigfoot stories coming from the Pacific Northwest and California, but here in Michigan, it's all about the dogman. I feel that usually when people think dogman, they think werewolf. But no, it's really nothing like that at all. Werewolves are normal people with a condition that turns them into bloodthirsty killers in the full moon. 
and then the only way to kill them is with silver, and the only way to appease their hunger is with blood. I'm convinced the Dogman is real, and I'm convinced that it is really just an unknown, misunderstood creature. I saw one, and I'm positive that they're just like wolves or coyotes or even deer, just part of the ecosystem. So here's why I think that. When I had my encounter, obviously, it terrified me. I was even afraid for my life because of all the stories that I had heard. I locked my door and I grabbed my gun and I stayed up the entire night waiting for it to come for me. But it never did. And when I think back on it, the creature wasn't really doing anything aggressive. It was like seeing any other animal late at night. Just that this one is an alpha predator. So here's how I ended up seeing it. I live in a little town not far from the Mackinac Bridge. I'm on the Upper Peninsula side. My buddy owns a small bar, and I help him out and I do some bartending every once in a while. He plows my private drive, so I do this to return the favor. It was April, just when things are starting to thaw out in the UP. I was working for my buddy on a Saturday night, and naturally, I wrapped up work for him pretty late. I think I left the bar about 3 in the morning. I don't think I was particularly tired as I was driving home. Some people have tried to say that I was seeing things because of fatigue, but I don't remember feeling fatigued, so I don't think it was that. My house is pretty deep in the woods. Most houses are in the Upper Peninsula unless you live in one of the back towns on the lakeshore. It was probably a 20-minute drive on the main road and then 10 minutes on my private drive to get back to my house. I saw the dogman on the main road, not far from my turnoff. There were absolutely no other cars out on the road for my entire drive. Not many people live in the area anyway, and I'm sure they were all tucked safe in their beds. My truck was the only headlights making their way down the road that night. So I'm used to seeing wildlife in the UP. We have moose, bear, loads of deer. They're not uncommon at all, especially late at night. When I first saw the dogman, I truly thought it was a moose. The reason I thought it was a moose was because of how big it was. If you've never seen a moose in person, they are absolutely massive. And the really big bull mooses stand about seven feet tall. And that's how tall this thing was. I was driving in my lane and the dog man was standing in the opposite lane, where the oncoming traffic would be. It was literally just standing there with its face towards me. It was like a deer in the headlights but a bipedal, wolf-like creature. We don't have many wolves in the UP, but I've seen lots of pictures, and its head was exactly like a wolf's, with big triangular ears and a long snout. Its eyes faced forward like a predator's, and they shined as two glowing orbs in the glare of my headlights. Its body was tall and long and slightly crouched over. I'm sure that if it had been standing fully upright, it would have been more than nine feet tall. All of its limbs were extremely long and dog-like. Its torso was covered in fur and its wide shoulders looked strong and powerful. I saw it for just a moment in the headlight and then I drove right past it. It didn't move or chase me. I kept checking in the mirror, expecting to see it running up behind me, grabbing onto my truck bed. Like I said earlier, this sighting absolutely terrified me. I rushed into my house, I locked the door, grabbed my gun, and I stayed up all night expecting that that thing was outside, following my scent, hunting me, chasing me home. But it never came. I have a security system in my house with three different cameras looking outside, and not a single one picked up on it. That's why I think that the dog man is misunderstood. If he had wanted to hunt me, he could have. I'm sure he could have busted down my door and my hunting rifle wouldn't have done anything against him. But it didn't do that. It just never showed up again after I drove off. I can't get the image of it out of my head, though. It was just standing there in the road. Like I said, a deer in the headlights. Like any other animal. I'm sure he's a fearsome predator when he wants to be. But I'm also thinking that he might be misunderstood. 
Maybe we're just afraid of them because it's impossible for us to understand them. I guess I'll never know. This happened when I was about 12 years old. It's pretty strange, and I still don't know if I believe what happened in the end was a coincidence or not. I'm also not sure if this is the normal kind of story you like to read, but it is the weirdest and most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. So, anyway, here goes. My best friend in the world at the time was my friend Kyle. We went to the same school, lived on the same street, he lived on one end and me on the other. We hung out pretty much every day. In fact, we had chicken pox together because our moms thought it would be the easiest way. His family inherited the house he was living in from his grandmother. Apparently, the entire neighborhood was built around World War II. Some houses were built before, some after, but around that general time period. I think his grandmother, when she was little, were the first people to own the house. We always seemed to have issues pop up on either home, you know, plumbing or electrical. Old homes have their issues. My mom used to say they have character, and you have to keep them going. But one day, after a really bad storm, Kyle's basement flooded, and it was off-limits to us. Meanwhile, that was one of our primary hangouts, so what were we supposed to do that day? We couldn't go to my house. My dad was working on some house project, and Mom was busy planning a birthday party with my grandmother for my uncle. So we had Kyle's house. We tried hanging out in the backyard. We tried watching TV. We annoyed his sister, but we were just bored kids. Anyway, I don't remember who suggested it. It might have been me, but when we were running up and down the stairs, I noticed the door to his attic. It was one of those old-time doors with the rope that acted like a handle, and you pull it down, you know, with the sliding ladder. I remember I pulled it down, and Kyle wasn't sure it was a good idea. We had gotten in trouble the week before because we were jousting each other with brooms on our bikes. One thing led to another, and someone, may have been me, got hurt. And then we got in trouble. Our moms were pretty angry with us. I didn't care, though. We were so bored. I just wanted to explore, I guess. So I took a little time to convince him. And when he was finally on board, we headed up into the attic. I remember I was worried about the insulation up there. It was pink, and I thought it could have been asbestos. I know it's weird, but that always entered my mind for some reason. I saw a warning for it on the TV once, and this attic was pretty packed with stuff. It also had picture albums, old Halloween costumes, old clothes, you know, a general attic used for storing what nobody remembers is even up there. And it was when we got to some of his grandparents' stuff that it got very interesting. We were looking through old pictures when we found this big, heavy trunk. It had all kinds of stuff on top of it, clothes, albums, books. It was a pain to get it all off. It was covered in old cracked leather, too, and the corners had metal protecting them. And there was this metal lining to the edges of the lid and the bottom. It looked ancient. I don't know how old it actually was. Somebody said they thought it was Kyle's great-grandmother's, but they weren't completely sure. At first, it was stuck closed. The latch was bent and we couldn't pull it. So Kyle ran downstairs to get a screwdriver. He was gone a while because his mom saw him and asked a million questions about the screwdriver, I guess. He told her something and came running back up the stairs. He tried popping the latch, but wasn't strong enough to get it, so then I tried to pop it open too. The thing was really stuck. So then I jammed the screwdriver under the latch, and then I got an old plunger that I found, and we slid the handle between the screwdriver and the trunk. Then we both yanked, and the latch finally popped. I opened it, and it was pitch black inside, like darker than it should have been. We got a flashlight and shined it in the trunk, and the light just didn't appear. It was like it was being eaten away by the trunk. It was the weirdest thing in the world. It just stayed dark inside there. We were shining light right inside, and it wasn't lighting the interior of the trunk at all. I couldn't believe it. We started freaking out a bit, and then we heard footsteps and then a loud creak, and we panicked, and we slammed the lid back down. I remember we ran like hell after that, and we left the door to the attic open. Well, that got us in trouble with our parents again. 
both Kyle and I were grounded for a week after that. I still have weird dreams about that day, but it gets worse. Here's what I mentioned in the beginning about the coincidence. So two weeks go by since we opened the trunk. Kyle and I are still freaked. We told some of our friends. Some believed us. Some didn't. Anyway, we decided we were going to bring some of our friends back to Kyle's house to see the trunk. But that same day, Kyle's mom and dad show up at school in the afternoon and his mom is crying. Apparently, their house completely burned down. It still gives me chills to this day. They lost everything in the fire. In fact, they stayed at our house for a few days before they moved in with Kyle's uncle. I don't want to say it happened because of what we found, but what are the odds? It is the weirdest, worst, most horrible thing that has ever happened in my life. I still don't know what to think about it, and I still get nightmares and weird dreams because of it. Have you ever been in the forest and suddenly, out of nowhere, something feels unexplainably wrong? You can't see anything out of the ordinary, but you just know. You know you shouldn't be there. Like the forest itself is telling you to leave. I'm here to tell you. If you're ever out in the wilderness and you feel that feeling, that overwhelming sense of dread, get out as fast as you can. Because I didn't. And what I saw will haunt me for the rest of my life. I was driving up to check on my uncle's cabin. It was located deep in the woods. To access it with a vehicle, you had to drive down an old logging road that seemed to just get narrower and narrower until you weren't sure your car would even fit. The cabin was on the water. The easier way to get there was via boat, but I never much liked boats. Even the 20 minute ride from the other side of the river sent me into a panic. So here I was, driving down this narrow road that was overgrown with weeds and young saplings. My uncle had just bought a house down south and he wanted to sell this cabin. I thought it was a strange and sudden decision since the cabin was his pride and joy for as long as I knew him. He built it himself, so it was a shock to me that he was going to sell. Physically, he was still in good shape and was able to do all of the maintenance on the property, but he said he just wanted to move on and left it at that. He kept saying he was going to get it ready, but he just never did. Both my dad and I offered to help him, but he told us to stay away from that house. Those words were exactly what he said. Stay away from that house. After my uncle left his cabin, things started getting weird. He started talking about all sorts of crazy things like aliens and stuff. You couldn't have a normal conversation with him. The empty cabin was the least of his worries and we all sort of forgot about it. After a particularly bad storm in the area, my grandma asked me to go and take a look around the cabin to make sure nothing had been damaged. I arrived at the property and as soon as I stepped out of the car, I knew there was something terribly wrong. There wasn't any storm damage that I could see, but something wasn't right. It was that feeling that you get in the back of your mind telling you to leave. Whatever the situation, just leave. I wasn't going to stay long, that's how I justified ignoring the feeling. It was a long drive from town because I flat out refused to take that boat, so it was going to be dark by the time I arrived. I planned to just take a quick look around and drive home again. I unlocked the door with the spare key my uncle kept underneath a rock. The inside of the cabin was in shambles. There were papers strewn everywhere. Just a mess. I had never known him to keep his home like this, but then again, he seemed to develop some sort of strange dementia in the last two months, so I didn't quite know what to think. I got caught up reading some of the papers that were lying on the kitchen counter. They talked about monsters that lived in the woods and ways to kill them. It was a bit insane. Suddenly I heard a tap on the window glass. I jumped and looked outside. I guess the scary stories were getting to me. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary out there, so I figured it must have been maybe a bird or bug flying into the glass. But as soon as I sat back down, I heard it again. I got up again, and that time it was dark out. Just a few minutes ago, I saw the sun set across the horizon, but now it was nearly pitch black, and I heard the tapping again. 
but this time it was coming from the front door. I just knew. I knew something was out there. I ran to the door, bolted it shut. I couldn't see anything through the windows, but whatever was out there could definitely see me. There was tapping and scraping at nearly all of the windows now. I went around the cabin. I closed the blinds on every window, trying to make sure whatever was out there could not see in. I remembered reading that the monsters from the papers were attracted to lights. So I darkened the house. And then the tapping stopped. I knew then that my uncle wasn't crazy, and I knew why he didn't want to come back here. I could see my car parked out in the driveway. I desperately wanted to get to it and drive the hell away from there, but I didn't want to take the chance not knowing what was outside. I accepted that I would spend one night locked in the house, but I wanted to get a look at what exactly was out there. I had my car keys with me. If they were truly attracted to the light, then this was how I would get a look at them. I hit the lock button and the headlights turned on. All of a sudden, a dozen creatures came out of the forest and swarmed at my car. They looked sort of human, but just sort of. They were pale and bald with large eyes. They looked like they had the ability to walk upright if they wanted to, but all of the ones that I saw crawled along the ground. They were fascinated by the car. I hit the horn button and it chased them, caused them to scatter, but only for a moment. As soon as it was quiet, they moved back in until the headlights shut off. They stayed away from the house as long as I kept the blinds closed and the lights out. I didn't sleep at all that night. I stayed up reading the information that my uncle had found about these creatures. I had to read under a blanket to avoid drawing them in. I couldn't find out how to get rid of them, and obviously my uncle couldn't either. They were gone by daybreak. So was I. The cabin still sits alone in that forest. My uncle still owns it, and he has no intention doing anything with it. He said, let the forest have it. And after what I saw out there, I agree with him. Being that I lived in the city, I never really got to experience nature much. Taking walks with friends through the various parks of Brooklyn was as close as I really got. Sometimes Prospect Park, sometimes Sunset Park, sometimes Highland Park. We mixed it up to keep things interesting and also based on what time we got done with work. Even so, during the day, the parks were always packed with tons of people and not very relaxing. I preferred to take strolls through the parks at night. No matter how dangerous everybody thought it was, normally I was with somebody and I didn't go alone. At night, we were either coming home from somewhere or just out getting some night air. This particular night, I was home alone. I didn't have any plans, but I was itching to get outside. The weather was cold and I knew the park would be calm and still. I decided I was going to take an evening stroll through part of Highland Park, which was close to my apartment. I was just going to walk from one exit to the other. The police were always watching the park for dangerous people, but also, I didn't want to chance it alone for too long. I bundled up and I headed out. I was an easy walking distance to the southwest entrance to the park, so I picked one and I headed towards it. It was a quiet area away from big roads and avenues. There was even a small cemetery that was closed down at this end of the park. Lots of history. Lots of quiet. I headed past the cemetery and I decided to take the horse path for a minute. It was shielded from the road by trees and brush. The trees also created a canopy over the path and the woods were on the other side. Although I was a little nervous, I just wanted to be as far away from the city as I could. Just these 20 yards between me and the road would be a nice buffer. Soon the path would open back up into the baseball field and then I could return to the road and head to the next exit. Entering the horse path was a lot darker than I had expected. It was about 11 o'clock at night, and there were no cars or people anywhere in the park. Usually you would even have teenagers roaming around here at night, but I assumed that everybody wanted to stay warm on this cold night, and so they sat this one out. In the distance, I could see the field and all the lamplights. 
but it felt like I was looking at a whole different world compared to the solitude of where I was. I stopped for a moment to breathe it all in. I was in my own little nature bubble, and suddenly there was movement in the trees and the hills ahead of me. The gates that enclosed the cemetery began to shake. I didn't feel any wind, so I didn't understand what could be shaking the old wrought iron fence. Not to mention, wind wouldn't be strong enough anyway. I had about 10 more yards to go, so I figured I should just walk faster and get out to where I could be seen. In the distance, I noticed a couple walking through the field. That made me feel better that somebody could hear or see me if something went wrong. I took a few steps, trying to ignore whatever was making the fence shake when suddenly the shaking stopped. So I stopped too. I looked around again, and before I could continue walking, something jumped down in front of me with a loud thud. The path beneath me shook, and now my view of the field was completely blocked by this giant figure. I could hear a low grunt. It sat in front of me, perched like a cat. It had to be over ten feet tall, though, maybe even bigger. It was dark, though, so there wasn't much I could make out at first. It was bony. It smelled like death. As my eyes got adjusted to the dark, I could see that it had a skeletal look to it. It had antlers protruding from its head. I kept blinking to see if my eyes would adjust more, and that's when the animal, or whatever it was, got up on all fours and began pacing back and forth in front of me. The body was so long, I could tell that the parts of it that were fleshy were hanging off of it, and the smell was rancid but I stood there mesmerized for some reason, rather than running away. The grunting continued. I began to make out its eyes, which were set back in its skull-like head. Its jaw was like a human jaw, but the jagged fangs sticking out were horrifying. The creature had remnants of a snout, like it was a dog that had had its face ripped apart. I could see a hole in the skull where the nose should have been. Before long, I snapped too, and then I was terrified, but I found myself unable to scream. This was a giant human, but also a giant beast, and it looked like it was in some sort of horrible pain. It stopped pacing and got on its hind legs again, as if it was showing itself to me. I noticed its rib cage was exposed, and it was so large that I felt like if the lighting were right, I would even be able to see the creature's heart inside. And then suddenly, as fast as it appeared, it jumped off through the trees and towards the road, wailing and grunting as it went. If there was anyone on the road, they would certainly remember this for the rest of their lives. I caught my breath and I ran to the open field to look for it, to see where it went. In the trees on the other side of the road, I could see movement, and I knew what it was. Before I could do anything else, a cop car pulled up on the path behind me and honked. He asked if everything was okay. I told him yes. He issued me a warning, a stern warning, that the park was officially closing soon, and that it wasn't safe for me to be wandering around in the dark anyway. If only he knew. I was on a hike in the Arizona desert, and I ended up getting lost. The area I was hiking in had several canyons and deep gorges. It was a beautiful location, but the trails weren't very well marked, and I must have gotten turned around. I didn't have any signal on my phone, so I couldn't use the GPS to pinpoint my location. It was getting dark, too, and I was almost out of water. The only flashlight I had was the one on my phone, and I didn't want to use it for fear of draining the battery. It wasn't a great situation, but I was afraid it was going to get much worse if I didn't find my way out soon. I wandered around for what must have been another hour with no luck finding my trail. It was dark by that point and I was settling into the idea that I would have to spend the night out there with no shelter. I didn't even have a jacket with me since it was so warm during the day, but the desert can get cold at night, very cold. I know it was stupid of me to not pack at least some basic survival gear, but I didn't and that was the situation I was in. My biggest worry was the cold and my lack of water. I hadn't even thought about the possibility of wild animals until I heard something moving through the bushes nearby. 
I used the light on my phone and shined it in the direction of the sound. And to my delight, I saw another person. I shouted at them to tell them where I was, and then I started explaining how I was lost. But I had stopped midway through my story because the person wasn't responding to me at all. They were just standing there, staring. At that moment, I knew something was weird, but I didn't know what it was yet. I waved my arm, and I asked if they could hear me. They waved back, but still didn't speak. So now I was not only worried about being cold, lost, and thirsty, but also about being trapped alone in the middle of the desert with a possible lunatic. I couldn't get a good look at the person to try to understand why they were acting this way, so I walked a few steps closer and tried talking again, but still no response. But they didn't even try to attempt to leave, just let me approach. When I finally got close enough to see who I was talking to, I almost fainted from shock. It wasn't a person at all. It stood like a person. It looked like a person from a distance, but it wasn't like a person at all. This thing was covered in dark brown or black hair all over the body, except for the face, feet, and hands. Those were brown or tan colored, and the skin was thick and leathery. Its face looked more like an ape than a person's, but its eyes, its eyes looked human. I screamed when I realized what it was, and then I ran. I didn't know where I was running to, I just wanted to get away from that creature. I was already lost, but I didn't want to get attacked by a monster. I didn't imagine my body would ever be found if something like that happened. To say I was terrified was an understatement. I ran maybe half a mile into the night and I thought maybe I was safe. I rested there for a moment. The sky was so clear and I tried to memorize the location of the stars. Maybe I could use them to navigate my way out of there. I then drank my last bit of water and I tried to breathe for a minute, but my moment of calm did not last. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shape moving towards me. I tried to evade it, but I couldn't. I set out running again, but every time I stopped to catch my breath, it was there. I didn't know what it wanted, but I knew it couldn't be good. I was nearly exhausted, but it was either run or end up caught by this thing. And so I ran again. I don't quite remember what happened after that. I'm pretty sure I collapsed from exhaustion, coupled with the lack of food and water. The next thing I remember was waking up on the ground near the trailhead. It was still dark, but I could see the morning sun starting to peek over the horizon. I was freezing cold, but some weeds and shrubbery had been laid over me. I didn't know what to think. Actually, I was afraid to think. I could see my car in the parking lot. It was the only one there. I hurried to get up and get to the car so that I could turn on the heat, but as I moved the plants off of me and dusted off my clothes, I noticed footprints in the dirt near where I had been sleeping. The footprints were massive. They looked like those of a bare human foot. I knew it was the creature. It must have carried me there, put those weeds over top of me so I wouldn't freeze. I was so afraid of that thing when I first saw it, and here it had tried to help me. I don't know how I would react if I ever saw another one, but I know that the one I did encounter wasn't a monster. And to be honest, I'm thankful it found me out there. I'm not going to sign my name to this because I'm afraid I might lose my job. I'm a park ranger near Clemson, South Carolina. I'm only writing because I think the people have a right to know what's out there. There's a cluster of parks here in what we call the Mountain Bridge Wilderness. It includes Table Rock, Caesars Head, and Jones Gap State Parks. I'm not going to tell you which one this happened in, but they're pretty close together. I think people should be careful in all of them. First off, I'm not the only person who saw this. The reason I was on this particular trail was because a hiker reported seeing something unusual. He was pretty rattled, but very vague. We all figured it was a hoax of some sort, so I was assigned to investigate it, and I had to hike six miles out on a trail that ends in a waterfall. This is a pretty rough hike and not very well traveled. Honestly, we have so many waterfalls in this area. People seem to prefer going to the ones that have easy access and end in a shallow pool where their kids can swim. 
This waterfall is pretty, but it's not very big, and it's not very popular. I was looking forward to the assignment. I'm not one for hanging out at the ranger's office or patrolling campsites to make sure nobody's breaking the rules. I usually volunteer if there's a job that takes me further out into the woods, like trail maintenance and stuff. So I was hiking this particularly steep stretch before you get to the falls when some rocks started sliding. Not like a rock slide disaster, just a bunch of smaller rocks and debris cascading down from above me on the trail. We have a lot of deer and some black bears here, and that sort of phenomena is usually caused by a large animal up ahead. So thinking it might be a bear, I was proceeding with caution. I got to the top and I looked around before I headed west in the direction of the falls. It's rare to see anybody up here, so I wasn't surprised to see the area was deserted. I was ready to take a load off, so when I got to the falls, I found a nice shady flat rock and I sat down with my water bottle, figuring I had earned the break. I was planning to scout the area afterward and then head back down. So I'm just sitting there, thinking about my day, when I heard something crashing through the brush on the other side of the falls. The woods are pretty thick back here. I stayed still and quiet, figuring some wildlife was coming to take a drink. It was something coming to drink, but it wasn't anything I had ever seen before. I kid you not, this thing looked almost like a deer, but only if the deer had died and started to decay. Its head was just bone, a skull with empty eye sockets, but it was definitely alive somehow and moving, not to mention huge. I know most people would think I was a lunatic, but I've heard you read some letters like this on here, so I know I can speak plainly. This thing was dead. Dead, but somehow alive. You could smell the decaying flesh on its body and see bones poking through here and there on its neck. It had lowered its head to the water like it was going to drink, and I'm sitting on the other bank, too scared to even breathe. All I could think of was, this is not real. And then it saw me. It lifted its head, and those empty eye sockets just pointed straight at me. And suddenly I could see the red inside them, glowing like coals on a campfire. I totally panicked, knowing this thing was some kind of a devil. I jumped up and I ran, but then I heard a splash. I didn't turn around, but I was afraid that the thing had jumped into the shallow water and was chasing me. I just flew down that trail, crashing into limbs, scraping my face trying to keep my balance on all those loose rocks. I'm lucky I didn't fall off the mountain and kill myself, to be honest. By the time I got maybe a mile and a half away, I slowed down and I listened. I didn't hear anything behind me. I can't explain what that thing was, but I know what I saw. Maybe it was some kind of an evil spirit, although you couldn't see through it. Or maybe there's just creatures out there that we never see because they've gotten so good at hiding. I also don't know if it was intending to hurt me. Was it chasing me? It seemed like it, but who's to say? There was an undeniable aura of, I guess you could say, evil around it. I know I never want to meet up with it again. I didn't report it. Maybe that sounds cowardly, but I didn't need to lose my job over this, or get told that I needed to see a shrink. I do think that people should be cautious going into the woods any woods, especially that area of South Carolina. There's danger out there, danger in a form of which you'd never expect. Please be safe, everyone. Don't hike alone. I had been an officer of the law many years prior to becoming part of the Transit Railroad Police. I had been working in a large city, and I wanted a change. So my wife and I moved to a smaller town and I got a job patrolling some important and historical railroad tracks in Pennsylvania. It was quite the shift. I didn't have to deal with nearly any of the stuff I had seen in New York, and it was much more peaceful. But I'll admit, I was going a little stir-crazy after about a month or two. It was literally just too quiet. My daily duties were pretty simple and they were as follows. Don't let anybody get into trouble. It was really rare when I had an occurrence where I needed to really be an enforcer. My wife was pretty pleased with this, 
but I sure did miss the action of the city. Staring at railroad tracks was like watching paint dry. Sure, I spent more time at home than at work, but the days felt like they just dragged on. I was waiting for something to happen. Something exciting. Anything. And sure enough, something did. It was a grim, rainy day. Everything was gray. Everything was wet. And I remember thinking, great, another boring day. People would rather stay inside and keep dry than go out on a day like this and stir up any trouble. Little did I know that mudslides were not unheard of with the areas of the railroad on days like this. We had plenty of landslide scares that day. My wife was pretty worried. She didn't like the idea of me being around a natural disaster. But I told her that after dealing with some pretty scary people in the city, a landslide would be a piece of cake. But I was terribly wrong. To make matters worse, I had been stuck late at work that day. I guess that's what happens when you take quiet life for granted. I was finishing up for the night. Many of the emergency disaster help had gone home after cleaning up, but I wanted to make sure that everything would be safe and okay for the next day. I also had this very intricate report that I had to fill out, very detail-oriented in this area, and everything was still pen and paper. No computer screens. My report took a few hours to fill out, and I figured that before I went home, I'd head out and inspect that same area of the railroad again. So I went back down to the area. The rain had cleared up, but the whole place felt pretty dreary. There was plenty of fog, which reminded me of some old spook show. And I just remember it hitting me, and me thinking, wow, this is pretty creepy. I don't like this. And that's when I saw something out west, towards the trees. I wasn't used to this many trees and being surrounded by full-on nature. I literally forgot about the possibility of a wild animal roaming. But when I got to remembering, I'm thinking, no, it's an elk or a deer or something like that. That wouldn't be unusual. The only thing that was unusual was that I could hear my thoughts out there. But I got back to business. I'm checking off this list of things, and I'm really trying to make sure I have everything covered. And then I hear something moving around off to the west again. So I stopped, I looked around, and I got to wondering about what would happen if I were to face an elk. Would the elk hurt me? I wasn't sure. I had some bear mace. That would work on an elk if it came down to it, I hoped. And just then, another officer down towards the office called my phone. He was asking if I was okay. I said yes, I was okay, just checking everything out. But I asked if they had ever been targeted by an elk. I was pleased to hear when he started to laugh, but then he said, but be careful of the wildlife. He explained that they could be dangerous, but to just hang on because he was headed my way anyway to help me finish. Something about the other officer's warning made me a little nervous. And the fog is now laying down so thick that I can't really see anything. Can't see if it is an elk or what. So now I'm thinking it could be a bear or something maybe more aggressive. So I climbed into my tiny patrol car and just hoped that the vehicle would protect me. And that's when I realized my car was facing west. So I turned on my brights. And you know what? I'm honestly getting goosebumps thinking about it. I saw what I had been sensing. Off to the west, something large was standing in the fog. And I'm telling you, it was huge. I don't think I've ever seen anything that large in my life. Yes, it was tall, but it was also very wide. Its posture reminded me a little of a gorilla's, with arms that were long and thick, just like its chest. And I couldn't really see its legs because the fog was so dense. And the thing didn't really seem to have a neck, either. Now, it looked like a gorilla's posture, but it didn't look like a gorilla. It didn't look like it even had hair. And it kind of looked bald, really. And gray. And it looked like a gorilla man made of, like, rocks. It was crazy. Between the distance that it was from me and the fog, it was a bit obscured. And it took off into the trees the moment I turned the brights on. By the time the other officer arrived... I was shaking. He didn't know what I was talking about. He guessed that maybe I had seen a bear. But it wasn't a bear. 
and there's no way in hell it was a bear. And also, I still haven't told my wife. I grew up in a suburb that was between New York and Philadelphia. It was pretty rural and my development was surrounded by farms. By the time I got to high school, more houses were being built as people moved away from the big cities for a lower cost of living. Things really started to change when online shopping took off. All the cheap farmland within a two-hour drive of New York and Philly was bought up by corporations and turned into shipping hubs, warehouses, and Amazon fulfillment centers. The whole thing really divided people. Most agreed that the prefab metal warehouses were an eyesore, but others argued that they brought in a lot of jobs, and they helped the local economy. Traffic got worse, the open fields and trees disappeared. It was all kind of sad, really, but it did help the economy, so I guess I shouldn't complain too much. I moved back in with my parents during 2020 and the pandemic. I work a remote marketing job, so it was an easy move. I wanted to get out of Philly for the shutdowns. While I was home, I really saw how much the landscape had changed. I noted all the new warehouses and storage facilities, but there was one in particular that caught my eye. My dad likes to hunt pheasants and grouse, so we always had bird dogs growing up. English setters, Brittany Spaniels, and German short-haired pointers to be specific. Anyone who grew up with working dog breeds know that they are high energy and they require a lot of exercise. As I was the only one working remotely in the house, it fell on me to walk the dog every day. These aren't normal leash walks around the block. We always let our dog run free through the fields and the thickets for an hour or two. Unfortunately, there were only one or two fields left to run him in. It was in these walks that I noticed something strange about one of the new warehouses built outside my parents' development. For starters, it was separated from any other buildings at the far end of the field, with a long driveway connecting it to the road. The driveway looped around the back of the building where there was a loading dock, which was shielded from prying eyes by a thick patch of woods behind it. All the other warehouses in the area were built in clusters to reduce cost and allowed them to share common roadways and loading docks for the trucks. But this isolated warehouse looked like it was purposely built to be inconvenient. I didn't think too much of the isolated warehouse at first, but as I noticed more weird details about it on my walks, I started to suspect that something was going on in there. There were no windows and only one entrance in the back of the building. The door had a large concrete block in front of it with a narrow slit. It reminded me of something that an archer would hide behind in a castle in Game of Thrones. There was no fence around the structure, but while my dog was roaming in the field, I noticed poles stuck in the ground with some dome-shaped cameras on top. And I could also hear the mechanical motors whirring as the cameras panned inside their cases to watch me. I never saw a no trespassing or private property sign, so I continued to let my dog run around on the property. The fourth or fifth time I was walking the field, something glinted in the sun from on top of the building. It caught my eye. When I got closer, I saw the glint was from the glass of a spotting scope. Two men were on the roof watching me. This is the first time I was spooked by the whole situation. If it was a single guy with binoculars, that would have been one thing. But the spotting scope... And the second guy made me think of those military movies where the sniper teams had one guy spotting and the other guy shooting. I cut the walk short and I went home. I didn't go back there for two weeks. The more I thought about the incident, the more I convinced myself that I was being ridiculous. No warehouse in the suburbs would have a sniper team on the roof. I was just letting my imagination go a little wild after seeing the cameras. Regular businesses care about corporate espionage, so there's nothing suspicious about having basic security. Plus, it wasn't like I actually saw a gun on the roof. Just two guys watching me, one with some optics. So I went back to the field because it was the only good place to let my dog off-leash within walking distance of my parents' house. The dog got himself wedged deep inside a thicket chasing squirrels, I could hear him rustling around in the trees, but he wouldn't listen to any of my commands, 
so I trudged in there after him. I came out on the other side of the trees at the back of the warehouse where the loading dock and the entrance were. Standing at the edge of the thicket was an angry-looking man holding my dog by the collar. I approached him slowly, and I tried to force a smile. As I approached, I saw the man subtly place his hand to his hip, and it was then that I noticed he was wearing jeans and a dark jacket. This was a few months into the pandemic in June or July. It was way too hot to be wearing long pants and a jacket. This was a huge red flag for me, but I needed to get my dog. You can't be here, he said to me gruffly. Sorry there wasn't any signs, and I've always walked my dog here, I told him. He clenched his jaw, and he just pushed the dog towards me. And that's when I noticed a line of vehicles coming up the driveway. They looked like they were driving in a formation. An 18-wheeler was being escorted by two black SUVs in front and two behind. The man stepped in front of me to block my view. He then laid a hand on my chest, and his other hand still hovering over the jacket pocket. And he told me to leave the property now. I don't know what was going on at that warehouse, but I'm convinced that it is either a government site or something a large and powerful corporation wants to keep hidden from the public eye. Either way, I don't go back there anymore. Northwestern Ohio, 2012. It was the summer of 2012, and I was camping with my twin brother Mike in the woods near Lake Erie, just west of Sandusky, Ohio. We did all the usual camping things like fishing, hiking, and canoeing. Basically, every day was full, and we went to bed early and woke up at dawn every day. One night, I had fallen asleep early, and I woke up at around 3 because I had to take a leak. I didn't feel like waking up my brother, even though Mom and Dad always made us promise to use the buddy system, even at our age. I thought that was stupid, so I didn't bother. Also, I basically didn't feel like it because I knew my brother would just whine and complain and I would spend more time trying to wake him up than it would take to just run to the bathroom and back. Anyway, the moon was almost full that night, so it gave off plenty of light for me to see everything outside the tent. Also, there weren't many bushes in the area around our site, so I didn't have to worry or be afraid of something hiding and waiting to sneak up on me. Watching too many scary movies can do that to you. As I was walking towards the bathroom, well, I should honestly say running because it was creepy out there alone, my heart suddenly skipped a beat when I saw something that scared the crap out of me. Not far from the path were two dog-like creatures just standing there, staring at me. I blinked to be sure I was really seeing what I was seeing and not still asleep, and that's when they took a step towards me. I completely freaked out, and I started running back to the tent, all the while listening to what sounded like they were chasing after me and making the strangest noises. And the weird thing is that the noises weren't so much a dog or wolf sound, but more of something like a human. It was the scariest sound ever, and it gave me goosebumps. These creatures were gaining on me, at least that's what it felt like from the sound of it but I was too afraid to turn around. I thought that at any second they would pounce on me and attack, but that never happened. But when I finally did make it back to the tent, my heart was beating so fast and loud that Mike woke up and asked what was going on. I told him what had just happened. He laughed, told me to shut up. Dude, I told him, if you don't believe me, go out there yourself and see. He laughed again and said, sure thing, I have to go anyway. So I sat there and I watched Mike stand up and head out of the tent. Even though he was totally irritating, I knew that this was serious. I couldn't let him go out there by himself. I followed him out of the tent and into the darkness. My eyes took a few seconds to adjust, but I could see him standing about 15 yards away, staring off at the trees. I walked over next to him and I looked in that direction too. Nothing seemed amiss on the surface except for the fact that we were staring into pitch black forest. But then as my eyes adjusted, I could see something in the shadows. It was a dog. No, it was part dog, part man. It didn't move or growl, it just stood there frozen. 
the dog part of it looked like any dog you would see in the neighborhood, but with yellow eyes and a dog-like head. The human part was just the upper half, like it stopped at its waist other than the fact that it was standing there on two legs like a man. To say that I was scared at that moment would be an understatement. I whispered to Mike and asked what he thought it was. He said he didn't know, but we needed to get back to the tent ASAP. I was about to say okay when the creature let out this horrific howl. The sound of the thing echoing through the trees was like nothing I had ever heard before. I think Mike and I had our hearts in our throats because we just couldn't say a word. And we didn't even wait one second. We just ran back to the tent and threw the flap open. We were both terrified. Mike was shaking and I felt like throwing up. I asked him what we should do now. And he said that he didn't know. But whatever we needed to do, it would have to be done fast. Because if this thing got in our tent, it would kill us for sure. At that same moment, we heard a dog howl in the distance. And we started to feel relieved until it was answered by another howl. Closer to us. Like, right outside the tent. It had followed us. And there was another one that it was talking to. Off in the distance. This thing wasn't wasting any time. Before we knew it, it had started digging under the tent flap. At first I thought this was impossible, then all of a sudden there were claws on our tent floor. Mike and I were both screaming hysterically at this point, but then it stopped, and there was nothing but silence. We waited inside the tent, not being able to see anything, just waiting for some sort of noise that would tell us what was going on. I'd say about ten minutes passed without a sound, so we decided to risk it and peek outside the tent. The thing was nowhere to be found, but there were what looked like dog tracks everywhere around the tent, circling it, and then leading off into the woods. We couldn't see the prints too far off in the darkness, but we could see far enough that we felt safe that the coast was clear to dash to the car, which was about a hundred yards away. It took us less than ten seconds to get there, it felt like, but when we looked back, we could see that we were now being chased. Three of them were now coming out of the woods, headed straight for us. They were just like the one we had seen at the campsite, but these looked to be about three times bigger, with darker fur. Mike flung open the car door as fast as he could, but when he turned back to me, I was gone. I had tripped over something, trying to get away. They were right on our heels, and they chased after us in a full-out sprint. I scrambled back up and I got to the car just in time, with Mike screaming in my ears to hurry to get inside. Before opening the door, I looked back just in time to see one of them running at me with its canine teeth bared, red eyes. And then the creature stopped on a dime, right in front of my face, with its breath reeking of death. But then, it just disappeared. I mean, I think it disappeared. Later, Mike would say that it had turned and ran off so quickly that it was almost like it vaporized. Mike was so intent on getting out of there that the car started moving before I was fully inside, and he almost drove off without me because I nearly fell out while trying to pull my door shut. We escaped the forest that night, but it still gives us nightmares to this day to think of what might have happened if we hadn't gotten back to that tent, but mostly back to the car. I don't know who or what those dog men are or where they came from, but I just want everybody who lives out in those woods to be aware that there are creatures there in northern Ohio, and you need to be careful. Now I've been researching ever since our incident, and I really believe that they came down from Michigan, since we're pretty close to the state line. I mean, I read that some people think they originated there. Or that there are large groups there. Either way, it's too close for comfort for me. This encounter takes place just north of Las Vegas, Nevada, in Echo Canyon State Park. The four people involved all live in Henderson, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. The four people include Jessica and three of her friends who had all been planning a camping trip for weeks. The plan was to head up north to Echo Canyon State Park and spend a few nights away. They were all excited to spend time in nature, away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Jessica was busy. She worked long hours at her job at the Hawthorne Suites Hotel, often working the night shift, 
and being so tired in the day that she didn't have much time for anything else. When she did have free time, she liked to spend it with her friends and family and being outdoors such as this. So she was especially looking forward to the trip. She had read about Echo Canyon but had never been before and it seemed like a perfect spot. But now, as they were getting closer and closer to the destination, Jessica started to have this weird sense of unease. She wasn't sure why, but something about it just didn't seem right. It was definitely a strange reaction. Echo Canyon is a beautiful place. The canyon walls tower above you and the river is crystal clear. There are plenty of places to explore and the group had plans to spend hours hiking and swimming. They were even hoping to find the hidden waterfall that one of them had read about. But as soon as they arrived at the campsite, Jessica's unease turned into outright fear. There was something about the place that just felt off to her. She couldn't explain it and she knew it was going to be hard for her to stay there. The group began to set up camp, but Jessica just couldn't shake the feeling. She tried to push it out of her mind, but she couldn't help but feel they were being watched. And then that night, Jessica's fear only grew. She could see the shadows lengthening and stretching across the campground, and she felt like something was stalking them. She knew she was being ridiculous, but she couldn't help it. She was sure that something was out there waiting to attack them. She then asks her friends if they all want to go back to the tents. She figured that if she could just get to sleep, maybe she could wake up in the morning and everything would be over. But everyone else was talking and having a good time, and they weren't ready to end the night just yet. The other truth is that Jessica was deathly afraid of the dark. She hadn't told her friends this, but ever since she was a child, she had been terrified of the night. She even sometimes had nightmares about creatures coming to get her in the darkness. Even still, she decided to brave the darkness and go to her tent by herself. For whatever reason, the mindless chatter wasn't her thing. At first, all seemed okay as she was walking back to the tent, but before long, she was convinced that she saw something moving in the darkness. She squinted, but couldn't quite make out what it was, and she wasn't even sure if it was anything. Maybe just shadows playing with her mind. The movement and the shadows moved closer, but still nothing that she could make out. And then after stopping and squinting into the trees a few times, a creature revealed itself breaking out of the shadows right in front of her. And now she can see that this creature is unlike anything she has ever seen before. It's standing on two legs, and it is taller than her. It has a long body with fur all over it. She's terrified. She can't even get her mind to think or her mouth to yell for her friends. She said it looked like a cross between a human and an animal, covered in fur eyes glowing red, and it had long, sharp claws hanging down at its sides. And then the creature opened its mouth, and Jessica could see that it had long, sharp teeth. All of it was too much. She panicked, but at the same time was unable to react at all due to her fear. So she stood there. The creature purposely was moving closer to her, and not before long, she could feel its hot breath on her skin. She tries to scream, but she can't. So without thinking, she tries to run back to her friends, but trips and falls to the ground. And now the creature is standing over her with its claws up and curled, ready to strike. Jessica knows for sure. She feels she's about to die. And then suddenly she hears a voice. The creature hears it too and stops moving towards her. The noise breaks the silence again and the creature runs off into the darkness. Jessica doesn't know what to do, how to react. So she stays where she is, lying on the ground, scared and holding her head in her hands. Within seconds, she hears footsteps coming towards her and she hopes that it's her friends. But she's too scared to lift her head and focus in the direction of the footsteps. Instead, she just cowers into herself even more, her head down, sobbing. And then she feels someone touching her. And she slowly opens her eyes to see her friend Sarah standing over her. Sarah's saying something, but Jessica can barely make it out. All she can do is watch Sarah's mouth moving. Sarah helps Jessica get herself up and leads her back to the campsite. Jessica is shaken mentally and her body won't stop shivering. 
but otherwise she's unharmed and has no physical damage. Sarah ultimately mustered the strength to describe the creature to her friends, saying that it was like a cross between a human and an animal, telling them it was taller than anybody she knew and covered in fur, with the red eyes and the sharp claws and teeth. She knew the story seemed absurd as she said the words out loud, but the look on her face had her friends horrified, and so they unanimously decided to pack everything up and leave. Even though it was basically the middle of the night, nobody wanted to stay any longer. They were all freaked out. Nobody wanted to be in the dark alone. And so they leave, quickly packing up their things and getting everything into the car. They don't even bother packing up in an organized fashion. They just throw the gear and the tents into the car and take off. They drive all the way home without much discussion, wanting to put as much distance between them and the creature as possible while they all think about what happened. In the end, none of them ever goes back to Echo Canyon State Park again. They're all too scared of what or who they might see. I wasn't always a believer in the paranormal, but my family and I unknowingly moved into a haunted house. The experiences I had there changed my perspective forever. It's easy to say that there's no such thing as ghosts because it's nearly impossible to prove it, but once you experience it directly, there is no denying it. Not only did I feel the presence of a ghost, but I also felt threatened and violated by it. I always thought people were making up stories when they talked about their experiences, but now I'm passionate about the paranormal. There's no way I could tell you everything that happened in that house. But there are a few things that I feel compelled to share with you. Spirits are not to be antagonized and messed with. We need to treat them with respect. We need to learn how to live amongst them instead of denying their existence. When we first moved into the house, we all thought it was perfect. It was big enough that all the kids had their own bedroom. The kitchen was enormous and the views were spectacular. It was right by the harbor in Massachusetts, and you could see hundreds of boats of all types traveling through. There were beautiful ocean views as far as you could see, and I'll never forget the smell of seawater that you got when you cracked the window open. It seemed too good to be true at first. My room was massive, and it had the most intricate carvings in the wood all around the room. I had never seen anything so beautiful. The first week we stayed there, we didn't have beds or anything, but I didn't care. I was just so happy to finally have my own room. Slowly but surely, we started to move furniture in, and it started to feel like home. One night, my brother and I were roughhouse playing, and we knocked a mirror off the wall. It shattered all over the floor. My mom made us go to our rooms for an hour just to calm us down. But it wasn't long before I could hear my brother running up and down the hallway. I just knew my mom was going to freak out at both of us, and I was probably going to be the one to get in trouble for his behavior. I timed it so that his footsteps were right outside my door, and I swung my door open to smack into him. I looked out into the hallway. There wasn't anybody there. Convinced that my brother must have run into his own room, I ran to his door and swung it open. I found him fast asleep in bed, and then I heard the footsteps again, and when I looked, there was nobody there. I remember my hair stood on end and it freaked me out so badly. I went back to my room and tried to sleep, but barely did. Later that night, I was startled awake, but I didn't know by what. So I started to sit up in bed and I squinted into the darkness only to see this dark figure leaning over me. I tried to scream, but I couldn't make a sound. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. And it felt like hands were on my chest holding me down. I tried as hard as possible to make a sound, but I could only shake in the bed. Finally, I was released. I screamed for my parents. They ran in to check on me and told me that I was just having a bad dream. I told them it wasn't a dream and that a dark figure was forcing me to stay on the bed. They told me there was no such thing as ghosts or spirits. They assured me that it was just a bad dream and encouraged me to get back to sleep. I was awake the whole night, staring at the foot of the bed. And then a few days later, I heard my mom and dad fighting over who was leaving the tub running. 
They both claimed to not use the tub, they only used the shower. So this became a common argument, and soon, every member of the family was getting blamed for leaving the tub running. My dad even got so mad one night that he shut the water off to the tub completely. A couple of minutes afterwards, we were all in the bathroom arguing about who the guilty one was, when the faucet turned on completely by itself. My mom asked, who's there? And the lights in the bathroom turned off. We screamed. We ran. A little while after that, it was my birthday. We were celebrating with cake. My mom told me to make a wish and then blow out the candles. I made the wish, took a deep breath, but before I could blow them out, all the candles on the cake went out and a pair of candles from the mantelpiece lit up. We all just sat there looking at the candles until my dad grabbed them and threw them into the garbage. We then just ate the cake and tried to pretend nothing had happened. Many years later, we looked the house up and it turned out that a man who lived there previously had killed his wife and then himself. It had made the local newspaper. One day, I'd love to compile a list of all my family's experiences there, as well as the experiences of anybody else who lived there and had the same experiences. It was crazy, and being in a place like that will turn anybody into a believer. I used to think that people who claimed to have seen things were always on the wrong side of the crazy fence. Aliens, monsters, cryptids. I mean, if they exist, then where are they all hiding? The world isn't such a big place that all these things are just hanging around with no real evidence. Well, I don't think that way anymore. I have my own story to tell, and it happened in, of all places, Queens, New York. I'm a patrol officer, still a rookie. I spend most of my nights walking down Jamaica Avenue, breaking up bar fights and shooing off loiterers. More of a glorified security, really. Despite the city's bad rap, I've never seen anything more violent than a few broken bones or knife cuts. I joined the force with the intent to protect and serve. I know that sentiment is slowly fading, but I truly believed I could make a difference. So that's why when I was alone patrolling one night, I jumped at my chance to try to be a hero. I had only a few hours left in my shift when a woman shouted at me from across the street and dodged her way through traffic to rush over at me. She was screaming that she had seen a woman dragged into an alley just up the block. She refused to come with me but gave a rough description of the alleyway and the nearby buildings. So this is where I messed up. I should have called it in and asked for assistance. I wasn't even supposed to be alone, but I had let my partner cut out for an hour so that he could have dinner with his kids. Instead, I raced down the street, feeling like John McClane and ready to save this lady's life. I wasn't prepared for what was about to happen. I reached the head of the alleyway and regained a small sense of clarity, meaning I was now starting to wonder what I was doing. I didn't know how many guys were waiting down this alley, or even if that woman knew what she was talking about, if what she said was true. I poked my head around the corner, and I could see that the alley was longer than I had thought. It looked like it ran a couple of hundred feet and ended at a high chain lake fence at the far end. Rubbish bags and dumpsters lined both sides of it, and a lot of my vision was obscured. I began to slowly walk down the path, and after a few feet, I could hear a strange grunting sound coming from behind a large dumpster. Fearing the worst, I drew my pistol and quickened my pace. Just as I rounded the corner, I heard a snapping sound, like a chicken bone being broken in half or something. And that's when I was met with a sight that is forever branded into my memory. A woman lay sprawled on the ground, bleeding from a trio of wounds on her thigh and shoulder. And someone was hunched over her, holding her left arm and obscuring it from my view. It looked like some filthy robe covered the whole guy, and the smell which I had originally chalked up to the garbage was nauseatingly putrid. I shouted for the guy to stand up and turn around, now, and at the sound of my voice he snapped away from the woman's body and ran over to the wall and put his back against it, facing me. This is when I finally saw its face. Its skin was sickly gray, flecked with splotches of olive color. 
Its eyes were two thin strips of pupilless yellow, and it had only a single slit for a nose and a pair of cracked lips. This thing didn't even look like it could be alive. It stared at me, obviously caught off guard by my sudden arrival. And now with my bravado lost, I tried to issue another order for the creature to get down on the ground, but it came out like a pathetic whisper. The thing must have sensed some momentary weakness in me because after waiting a brief moment, it bared two rows of needle-thin teeth and launched itself at me from the wall. I don't even know when I raised my pistol. My hands were shaking almost uncontrollably. But I let out two shots from my gun and I swear I saw both impacts on the thing's chest. But it didn't slow down a bit. The last thing I saw was a dirty gray hand swinging towards my head and everything faded to black. I think I was only out for a few moments. My cell phone was ringing loudly in my pocket and I got myself up. My head felt like a lightning bolt had gone through it and it took a minute for everything to sink back in. Looking over and seeing the woman laid out on the ground hammered the scenario home. I ran over to her and thank God she was still breathing, but unconscious. Reality sank in on just how horrible this situation was and I knew I needed to call it in. Within a few moments, a bus arrived, as well as a handful of other officers and a detective. I received treatment for my head, and then I was asked a series of questions. Needless to say, both my partner and I were in a lot of trouble. I'm looking at a possible suspension for acting so rashly, and my partner is probably going to lose his job for being AWOL. Both of these things pale in comparison to what the woman experienced. She had several fractures on her legs and arms, and I knew that the wounds that I saw were bite marks. She was in rough shape, but the hospital said she would make it through. As far as the thing that did it, well, the sketch artist had a rough time. I described it the best I could, even though they gave me some side eye with my description, but I know that whatever it was, it wasn't human. I just hope that somebody catches that thing before it hurts someone else. I don't know how I get myself into these situations. I mean, I don't even like to go camping. So many times I've tried and I just end up being cold and wet and uncomfortable. Also, I hate to admit it, but I barely know what to do with myself anymore when I don't have an internet connection. But I don't mind renting a cabin on occasion. I've found plenty of them that have electricity and even Wi-Fi sometimes, but I have this loyalty to a couple of my childhood friends, and they love camping. Especially the kind of camping where you have to hike in to get to your spot. So, every once in a while, I let them talk me into it. They convinced me to go with them during one of our college breaks. Maybe it was because I was the one with the fancy tent. I had inherited it from my brother when he upgraded to an even bigger one. He had two kids and a wife, so he needed a lot more room. My friends had their eye on this place in the Great Smoky Mountains. The plan was for a three-day trip with a lot of hiking in and camping and hiking out. It really was too cold for my liking, but things were going okay the first day. It was a sunny day in spite of the temperature. We did plenty of drinking that first night and had a blast laughing and talking, and when I was laying in the tent that night looking up at the stars, it was almost pleasant. But the next morning, it was cloudy and it kept raining on and off. I was trying to pack up and everything was getting soggy, and I was getting grouchy. If it had been raining steadily, I could probably have convinced the others to shorten the trip, but the sun kept peeking out and pretending like it was going to actually turn into a nice day. The rain turned into a mist that my friends thought was cool and kept saying how it would be fine. But during the afternoon, the temperature really dropped, and I couldn't even pretend to be having fun. I stopped walking and said I wasn't going any further. And since I had the only tent, they could either stay with me or go on without a shelter. Obviously, they stayed. We got the tent up and a fire going to dry out our clothes. At least we had more wine to raise our spirits and the rain was holding off. We were trying to get into a jovial mood, but one of my friends started acting a little weird and nervous, and kept looking off into the woods. 
it was starting to make me nervous too. I asked her what she was looking at, but she just said she felt a little off and kind of creeped out. Well, that didn't help my mood, and I got paranoid. The Great Smoky Mountains are known for having plenty of black bears. I had heard that they were mostly harmless, especially if their cubs weren't threatened. I wasn't interested in taking any chances, though, and there were plenty of other things that could be hiding in the woods. We decided that since the weather had been so wet lately, it wasn't likely that anything would catch fire. So we left the fire burning a little and went into the tent. And it still wasn't raining, so we left the tent flap a little unzipped to be able to keep an eye on the fire. I was really sleepy though, so I guess I dozed off right away. But it seemed like only a few minutes had gone by, and I jolted out of my sleep and sat straight up. I thought for sure that I had heard something moving outside the tent. I looked at my friends. They were wide awake too. We looked out at the glow of the fire. The embers had burned down pretty low. I was straining my eyes and I thought I could make out antlers just outside the tree line. I wanted to feel relief at the thought that it was only a deer. But for some reason, that sight made me feel ice cold to the core of my being. It made absolutely no sense. I had no fear of deer. It looked like it was stepping a little closer towards us, and when I saw the shape emerge, I was horrified. It couldn't be a deer because it was standing upright, and it seemed eight feet tall, maybe? I wanted to scream or cry, but instead I just shut down. I saw these yellow eyes come glowing out of the darkness, and they seemed to be embedded in the skull of a deer. I had this weird thought that some devil creature had stolen the deer skull and was wearing it for its own evil purposes. There's also this terrible smell of rotten flesh that drifted over to us, and we looked at each other like this was the end. When I looked at the thing, it actually seemed like it was dead, like some rotting corpse that was somehow walking around. It looked like it had tattered flesh hanging off of it. But the worst part was how it made me feel hollowed out, and I had the sense that I was possessed with a demonic hunger that could never be appeased. What happened then was so weird. We all spontaneously took hands and closed our eyes and started to pray. Let me tell you, there wasn't one religious bone in any of our bodies. I hadn't been in a church since I was 12. My one friend looked and started describing how she could see a luminous, protective light surrounding our tent. She was sure that it was an impenetrable light through which evil could not enter. We must have stayed in that circle together in the tent for 20 minutes. And eventually, the desolate feeling withdrew and everything was back to normal. I don't know what more to say. The whole experience was mind-blowing, and I was left with some kind of a faith that I still can't define. This is an odd story. I tell this story at least once a year, usually at the bar because I've had too much to drink. Also, no, I was not drinking at the time. That seems to be the follow-up question every time I tell it. Luckily, also, I was not the only person to experience what happened. My sister and two of my friends were there as well, and they can completely back me up. This happened a few years ago. We were getting ready for a big Halloween party. It wasn't on Halloween, it was the weekend before. We usually throw a big party, though, since Halloween is big in our family. We're of Irish descent, so anything related to the Irish, like Halloween, we blow it up big time. We spent most of the day hanging decorations throughout the house. We had already hung lights and put some stuff up outside, inflatables and a couple of dummies. One was a scarecrow sitting on the bench outside. We had a witch. They all turned out great. I also had just bought a bunch of firewood and I made a giant stack next to the pit outside. People started coming over around six or seven. The first few hours, we had a ton of people show up. But you know, as the night progresses, people come and go to other parties and they might come back later. The later it got, the smaller the party got, until eventually around midnight, there was maybe 15 or 20 of us. Some were in the house, some outside around the fire. We have a pretty big property, 
not huge, but it goes way back. And there's a tree line at the very back that leads to a park. At one point in the night, we heard something fall over in the shed, and the noise freaked a few people out. So a few of my friends and I went to investigate. We used our phones as flashlights and we walked back to the shed. The shed is about halfway between our house and the back of the property by the trees. When we got back there, I slowly opened the door and we flashed our lights and looked inside. A bunch of stuff had fallen. Tools, yard equipment, they were all over the place. It was weird, but it made sense and explained why it had been so loud. The only way you can get into the shed, though, is through the one door, and it was shut when we walked up to it. One of my friends suggested that things were probably not as secure as we had thought when we got things out of there earlier, and then they fell and dragged the rest of the stuff down, or something like that. I closed the door and we walked back to the fire pit and basically just forgot about it. A few more hours go by and more people start to leave. It's about two in the morning at this point. I walk with two of my friends to their cars and we hear something shuffling in the dark. We stop and I shine my phone at my friend's Jeep. Something moves next to the wheel of the Jeep. I turned the light off to see if it would come out again and I just stood there with my friends for a few minutes. I then turned the light back on and shined it towards the wheel. Standing there is this little humanoid thing, and it ducks back toward the jeep wheel. We all saw it, but nobody could get a good look at it at first. So we turned the light back off, and then we quietly moved forward a little bit. I turned the light back on, and the thing is still there. It had these big shiny eyes and little ears. Its arms and legs were long and thin, and I could see one of its little hands holding on to the tire. It seemed to have six slender fingers gripping into the grooves of the tread. It was shaking, and then one of my friends began to freak out, and the thing disappeared. We ran over to where it was, but now it was gone. We spent the next hour and a half looking all over the property for any signs of that little guy. We never found the thing. We looked over the area around the Jeep, too. There weren't any footprints or handprints on the Jeep or the tires. And that's when we remembered the shed. We moved quietly back to the shed and threw the doors open. There was nothing in there but the mess that we had seen earlier. We then thought about going back into the trees, but decided it would probably just be harder to look for something back there at this time of night. The next morning, though, my friends and my sister helped me go over the area again, and that's when we began to find some stuff. Weird stuff. Not near the jeep, but next to my sister's car there was this weird little pile of acorns. Only about four or five of them, kind of stacked next to her tire. And then we found a wad of string under my friend's Ford Taurus. There was about two feet of it, wadded up in a ball. We brought the things into the house and showed my other friends who didn't believe us when we told them the night before. They still didn't believe us. They thought we were messing with them because of Halloween. I decided to sit outside at night for the next two weeks. It was tough, but I stayed awake for most of those nights. Two of my friends who saw it came over and hung outside with me too, but we never did see anything. Sometimes when I find weird stuff, it reminds me of that night. My sister never wants to talk about it. My friends and I who saw it, though, have told a few people. Most don't believe what we're saying. I don't know what we saw or if it will ever come back, but I think about that little thing often. Have you ever heard of a creature that fits this description? Please let me know. I was a police officer in the north woods of Minnesota. Given the area, the number of vehicle collisions with wildlife was quite high. Standard procedure was to make sure the occupants of the vehicle were all accounted for and received proper medical attention, report the damages to the vehicle or other property, and dispatch the injured animal if necessary. Now, nobody calls an ambulance when they run over a raccoon, but we have deer, elk, moose, and bear up here that can cause some real damage. The worst two animal collisions I've ever seen were from bear and moose. 
Just last summer, I was on the scene of a driver who hit a male black bear with a Dodge Ram. The truck was totaled, but luckily, the driver survived with few injuries. Moose are probably the worst, especially if you're in a car or a small SUV. More often than not, the vehicle strikes the moose at the knees and it falls on top of the car and crushes it. Many people don't survive that. Accidents with white-tailed deer are by far the most common, and they vary from totaling the car to getting away with a scratch or a broken headlight if it's not a direct impact. If I get a call about a vehicle collision with a moose, I know it's most likely going to be bad. If it's a deer, it could be anything. And after what I saw on that cold October night, I do mean anything. I was called along with an ambulance about a vehicle collision with a deer. The dispatcher said that there was only one occupant in the vehicle and she was reported to be mostly uninjured. But when I got there, I saw it was a teenage girl. She had a few cuts and bruises from the airbag deploying, but seemed medically all right otherwise. She was pretty shaken up, but most people are after a vehicle accident, so I didn't think anything of it at the time. Her vehicle, a newer model SUV, looked like it was totaled. The front end was completely smashed in and the front windshield was shattered. The front right tire was barely attached. To be honest, I was surprised that the girl didn't have any other injuries. I noticed what looked like bits of muscle tissue and deer hair on the front of her vehicle, or what was left of the front of her vehicle. I didn't see the deer lying anywhere, but I didn't imagine it could have survived an impact like that. There was something strange though, too. The whole front of the car smelled like decomposition. The accident happened only a few moments before, and yet the pieces of deer smelled already rotten. It wasn't the heat from the engine searing the hair, either. It was something else. It smelled like something that had been dead for weeks. I was on a wellness check once for an older gentleman who had unfortunately passed away before we arrived. The medical examiner gauged him to have been dead at least a week, maybe a week and a half. Now, if you've ever smelled a decomposing body before, that sticks with you. And that is exactly what this smelled like to me. I looked around in the ditches for some rotten roadkill to explain the stench, but I didn't find anything. I pulled one of the EMTs away and asked if they could smell it too. And they said that the scene had smelled like that since they had arrived. The driver looked like she would be okay, and that was the important thing right now. When I talked to her, she didn't appear to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. She overheard me talking to the EMT about the smell, and she claimed it suddenly came out of nowhere right before she saw the deer in the road. This particular stretch of road was right at a blind corner, so she didn't see the deer until it was too late. She hit it head on at 45 miles an hour. When I asked some other questions, she said the deer looked sick. Its fur was long and matted longer than a normal deer's fur usually was. And she said it was skinny and she could see its bones, like literally see its bones. She said it had patches of skin missing and she could see its white rib bones poking out past the muscle. It must have been an already injured deer, maybe with gangrene. Most likely it had been hit by a vehicle before and suffered some pretty severe damage. It's not a common situation, but it's not unheard of. It was either that or else the deer was suffering from chronic wasting disease or brain worm. Those theories went right out the window though when she described its face. She said it looked like a skull, white with no hair at all on it, and that it had antlers like an elk and, get this, no eyes. They were just empty black sockets. I started to question whether this girl might actually be on some type of drug because the whole thing sounded insane. I started looking around for the deer. We were surrounded by woods on both sides of the road, but I doubted this thing could have gotten far. I didn't even step off the road before I noticed the outline of white antlers among the trees. The girl was right. They looked just like elk antlers, but the animal didn't appear large enough to be an elk. 
is looking directly at me, as if it had been watching us the entire time. I couldn't see its face in the shadows of the forest, but the smell of decomp grew stronger, and though I didn't know exactly what I was looking at, I knew there was something terribly wrong here. I pointed my flashlight at the woods. I only saw the creature for a second. The girl's description of it was accurate. Its face was a skull. No eyes, just black holes in its head, skinny and matted. I shined the light directly at its face. It tilted its head, just like a dog does when it hears a strange noise, like it was curious. It rustled its antlers in the brush. I thought about shooting at it, but if this thing survived that accident, I wasn't sure a gun could take it down, and I didn't want to find out the hard way if I was wrong. I told the EMTs to hurry up and stay inside the ambulance. They must have thought I was crazy. I waited there for the tow truck after the ambulance left. The creature stayed the entire time, just watching. The only part of it I could see was the outline of its antlers. It kept itself in the shadows. I put collision with a deer on my report. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't imagine anyone would believe me otherwise. I haven't seen anything like it again myself, but I've heard other stories from the area, and thank goodness for that. At least it makes me think I wasn't crazy that night. I'm a contract logger, and I have an interesting story regarding something my crew and I experienced last summer in Alaska. I was in the area for a three-month contract. I had been working for my boss for a few years, so I had a pretty good thing going. And I was, and still am, close to a handful of the guys on the crew. Once all the paperwork was figured out, I headed north on a flight with two other guys who lived near me in California. We each see each other regularly and usually get called in on these jobs together. Their names are Jed and Chuck. Both have about 10 years on me, but my dad and granddad were also loggers. So it's in my blood, and they respect that. We flew out to meet our boss and the rest of the crew, about 15 people in total, including two greenhorns who were training on skids. I'm a skidder operator myself and was slotted to do just that on this job. The first day, we just settled into the lodgings we were given by the forestry service, and the next day, we went out to check out the acreage. We were out in the Tongass in southeast Alaska, an area that's been logged for centuries. Our boss went over the plans with us for how to handle the layout of the land and what to take down first. It was pretty cut and dry, and we were going to be out there from June to late August perfect time to be in Alaska since that's about the height of summer, with the best weather, so I was also looking forward to exploring as much as I could. The land we were working was pretty straightforward, with only a small rise to the west. Nothing I couldn't handle on the skitter. Jed also works a skitter, and Chuck is a faller, one of the guys who actually cuts down the trees. He's also a climber as needed, which is important to this story. About two weeks into the job, one of the green guys injured his ankle when a log rolled onto it and Chuck had to replace him for a bit as a climber. Climbers get up high and lob off the limbs at the top to make it safer to take down the rest of the tree. The view, especially in Alaska, must be amazing, but I have problems with heights so it's not an option for me. So he was up on a Sitka spruce checking his harness before making cuts when he suddenly stopped and called down on the radio. I can see something heading this way from the east, he said, which was unusual considering the amount of noise we were making with saws and machines. East of where we were was a slight ridge, and Chuck explained that the animal was walking near the edge of the ridge but still back in the trees. Our boss... Frank said not to worry about it. It wasn't in the area we were logging, and it would surely be scared away by the noise. Chuck got back to work, and I was dragging a load of trunks up to the landing. About a minute later, he got back on the radio to report that the animal was getting closer along the ridge. Jose, another climber who was over on another spruce, reported the same. He had a clearer view of the animal and relayed down 
that it was white. Jed got excited thinking it might be a spirit bear, an all-white black bear that's very rare to see. But within seconds, Jose got on the radio again and sounded scared this time. Frank tried to calm him down, but Jose started climbing down immediately. Chuck stayed up in his spruce, but was very quiet. I radioed up to him on another channel that we sometimes used just to chat, and I asked if he was okay. It took a few tries before he finally responded. I don't think it's a bear, he said in a serious voice. It's too big. He was quick to get back on the other radio and have a talk with Frank, confirming that whatever it was was staying along the ridge. Frank gave in and called lunch early. Jose was freaked out at this point, but Chuck was still calm. He told Jed and myself that he was absolutely sure it was not a bear. Jose agreed. Jose thought it was a Yeti. I laughed at first, but when Chuck didn't laugh, I asked if that's what he thought it was. He said that while he hadn't gotten a clear look at it because of the distance, it did carry itself like an ape. And that was hard to argue with since apes and bears move very, very differently. Both men claimed that it had been walking on two legs, bipedally, along the ridge line, and it kept stopping as if it was trying to see what we were doing. When lunch ended, Chuck got right back up in the spruce. He then radioed down to us that the creature wasn't anywhere that he could see. I never got a look at it, but from how Chuck and Jose reacted, it sounds like they saw something they hadn't been expecting to see in the area or anywhere. I wouldn't be totally surprised if we found out it was a Yeti or something like that, because the Tongass National Forest area is huge, basically a little over 16 million acres. And that could explain why whatever it was hadn't been scared off by the sounds and could have been drawn into them instead not knowing what they were. Throughout the rest of our time there, Chuck and the other climbers, there were four on the team in total, kept their eyes out, but never saw the creature again. If it was a Yeti or a Bigfoot or something similar, it probably got the message that it shouldn't be in the area and headed off in another direction. Since then, I keep an extra eye out on our jobs, but I haven't experienced anything that strange again, even in the deepest woods. I'm a fire specialist with the Department of Natural Resources in a Northwestern state, but I'm not comfortable saying which state. In case anybody out there is not familiar with that title, a fire specialist is just like a regular firefighter, except that we only deal with fires that happen in our parks and game lands. I'm the type of guy who just clocks in does what he's told, clocks out at the end of the day, and leaves it behind. Life's too short to dwell on your job after you punch that clock. But recently, something happened on the job that really disturbed me. I've been back and forth over whether I should say anything. My wife says no, that I should leave it be. But I think the people have a right to know. One of our state forests here is very large and very popular. It's a great place for fishing and camping, and it gets pretty crowded in the good weather. A buddy of mine is a ranger there. We were having a few beers one night, and he told me that there had been a rash of Bigfoot sightings in the park. Now you might laugh, but I didn't, and neither did he. It's more common than you think for people to see strange things in the forest, at least around here. While I personally have never seen anything that looked like a Bigfoot, there's been times I've been in the woods and felt like something was watching me. And mind you, that's even happened after an area has been evacuated of the general public, like when we're about to do a controlled burn. Now when my buddy told me that, I just asked him if anybody had managed to get any pictures. We're all waiting for that day when somebody finally snaps a picture and proves the existence of these things. He said no, but he and one of the other rangers decided to set up game cameras right in the same area that people had reported seeing the creature. I didn't think too much of it, just said, cool, keep me posted, and we moved on to another subject. Then about a week later, he calls me, all excited, and he says they did it. 
They got an image. I was stunned. He said it was pretty clear and no one would be able to say it was fake. So of course I wanted to see it. He told me to come on by the station whenever I could get over there. It's about an hour away. Well, we had some family stuff come up right after that or I would have gone immediately. Nothing serious, but you know, family comes first. It was five days later when I finally called my friend and told him I'd like to come by in about two days. That was my next day off. I had to leave a voicemail because he didn't pick up his phone. Then the evening before I was supposed to go and see him, I got a call from my supervisor. He instructed me to report the next day to the regional office for a controlled burn. I said, what? That's my day off. There were no wildfires going on, so why pull me in? He said it was non-negotiable, and that was that. He didn't give any details, just said I would find out more at the regional office. So, that stunk, but whatever. I showed up there the next day with five guys, and we were given the specifics. I was shocked. We were going to burn a whopping 500 acres, based on a spur-of-the-moment decision. I bet you can guess where, too. That's right. They were having us do a ping-pong ball drop right smack over the area that had all of the Bigfoot sightings. A ping-pong ball drop is when we fly over with a PSD dispenser on board. It injects glycol into a plastic sphere that contains potassium permanganate, and then it shoots it out of a helicopter. The combination triggers a thermogenic reaction, igniting the area in a flash. The only other times I've ever been involved in a ping-pong ball drop was when an area was already on fire. It's safer than going in on foot. I'd never seen it used for prescribed burn around here before, but we did it. 500 acres went up in flames and I couldn't help but wonder if the reason was that they found out that the Bigfoot creature was really in there. I tried calling my friend, wanting to get his take on it. I kept getting his voicemail and he never called me back. So I finally had a day off and I went over to the park that he worked at. There was a new guy there that I had never met before. And he said my friend had been transferred, but he didn't know where. This whole thing reeks to me of a cover-up. Last time I talked to him, he was excited about how he and another ranger had finally gotten some pictures of the creature. I wish he had told me that guy's name, the last name at least, though I wouldn't be surprised if he was transferred too. Anyway, I wrote him a letter telling him about the ping pong ball drop. I didn't say too much, just in case the letter ever gets intercepted, but I wanted him to know, in case he didn't already. I figured his mail will get forwarded to wherever he's living now. All I can think is, maybe he's avoiding me. Maybe because he was told not to talk about the picture. It would take a pretty serious threat, though, for him to stay quiet. He's a pretty hard-headed guy. I guess that's all I have to say, except now... Whenever I'm told to do a controlled burn, I'm going to wonder if there's an ulterior motive.